Frida Kahlo Post presents multiple vintage photographs, some never seen before, contextualized among selected paintings, works on paper, ephemera, and rare film footage. The photos span Kahlo's entire life. We see childhood photographs, like the one we see here, the most iconic fashion photo by Nicolas Murray, and even a photograph of Kahlo on her dead bed by Lola Alvarez Brown. The photographs are on display alongside artworks created during Kahlo's teenage years, like this rare print from 1925. This magnificent painting, It's Squintly Dog and Me from 1938, when she was truly in her prime. And we even show her very last self-portraits composed just before her death. The one on the right is as yet unfinished. Also on view, we have rare film footage from 1932 until her last day. You can see a preview here. And uh, the, the works that we have are well-known films like this one by Nicholas Marai from The Blue House. from 1932 when she was in Detroit, even drawing, when she went to get Trotsky, film of her painting, towards the end of her life, leafing through her diary when she was already bedbound, and this rare experimental film that's unfinished of Kahlo interacting with a young woman in a way that is uh, quite suggestive and beautiful. The exhibition is organized in five overlapping sections, posing, composing, exposing, queering, and self-fashioning. The materials emphasize the significance of photography in Kahlo's life and creative process, and the profound and very generative interplay between photography, fashion, art, and the construction of identity. The show also sheds light on Kahlo's performative self-representations and her bold embrace of queer, non-binary, and gender fluid ways of being. So the first section is titled Posing, here you see an installation shot. Circe? Yeah, thank you, Granit. So Frida learned how to strike a pose as a toddler. When she cast her intense gaze at her beloved father, the photographer Wilhelm Guillermo Kahlo. While still in her teens, she constructed and performed distinct gender identities in front of the camera. On February 7th, 1926, Guillermo uh, Calo photographed his daughter, Frida, cross-dressed in a man's three-piece suit, sporting an ornate walking stick, like a dandy. The very, very same day, and you can see in the same location, she donned an elegant European-style dress, and with books on her lap, she posed as a sophisticated young woman. In these photographs, for example, by Edward Weston and Imogen Cunningham, we see how in her 20s, Kahlo began to compose her iconic style as a paradigmatic Mexican woman. Although her wardrobe makes elements from different regions, she identifies specifically with the culture and attire worn by the women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Oaxaca, which is located in the southeast part of Mexico. This region is renowned for its matriarchal societies who have preserved their indigenous culture in the face of colonialism. So here, for example, we see Kahlo wearing one of her favorite rebosos, and Kahlo adopted this um, richly embroidered blouses called huipiles, floor-length skirts, 
and woven shawls or what we know as rebosos, as well as an assortment of accessories, jewelry, and braided hairdos of the Tewanas. Exposing this attire allowed her to conceal her severe disabilities. She had polio at the age of six, and then she suffered an almost fatal accident at the age of 18. This dress would help her conceal her disabilities while also reinforcing and displaying her indigenous heritage. Kahlo's mode of posing for photographs strongly impacted her painting. Her intense, unflinching gaze appears in photographs and paintings alike. We also see the meticulous care with which she fashioned her style and that it parallels the fastidious way she composed her paintings during the prime of her life. Sadly, both unraveled as her life force waned. Posing for photographs then, not painting, was Frida Kahlo's first form of self-expression. Her doting father was her first photographer. And as soon as she could sit up, he cultivated her predilection to perform in front of the camera. Kahlo's mesmerizing photogenic allure then continued to impress a host of exceptional photographers throughout her life. So as noted, Kahlo's first medium of artistic self-expression was photography. She collaborated with many photographers to pose, compose, and perform her identities long before she became a painter. In photograph before the age of six, as we see here, she smiles sweetly. After she contracted polio, her unsmiling face and intense gaze became a constant feature. She recalled that her illness and her bullying experiences subsequently transformed her into a sad introverted child. In this unfinished drawing that's on view in the show, based on photographs taken at the age of four, 12, and 22, Kahlo traces, here we see the photographs that impacted her uh, drawing, Kahlo traces her process of becoming from a toddler to a young woman. The intervals between the images mark periods of coping with pain and trauma, uh, first due to polio and then the bus accident that Circe noted. The drawing reveals the influence, the direct influence of photography on Kahlo's self-portrait, which would continue uh, throughout her life. So, for example, this section shows how the exhibition combines well-known photographs like this by Guillermo Calo, Guillermo Davila, and Imogen Cunningham, as well as by anonymous artists like this one that has never been displayed before, or at least to the best of our knowledge, no, Janine? Yes, yes, we've never seen it before. And we're really thankful that we have it on view. So we continue. So Carlos photographs from the early 1930s were taken in Gringolandia, which is the term she used to describe the United States. So shortly after her marriage to Diego Rivera, they traveled to San Francisco on what was Carlos first journey away from home. So Rivera was a celebrated artist who was commissioned to paint murals in San Francisco, in New York, and Detroit. And Carlo was initially patronized as his exotic third wife, wife sorry, who gleefully dabbles in art. Carlo's experiences in the United States were complex and transformative at the same time. It was in San, in San Francisco that she fashioned her Tijuana style. As previously mentioned, she was photographed by brilliant photographers. And here in San Francisco is where she began to paint seriously. Carlo wrote to her mother, the gringas really like me a lot and take notice of all the dresses and rebosos that I brought with me. Their yaws, 
drop at the sight of my jade necklaces and all the painters want me to pose for them. It's interesting that only after she was photographed as a Tijuana, because it wasn't painters as much as photographers for whom Kahlo posed, but only after she was photographed as this Tijuana woman did she paint herself as one. Here on the right, uh, she painted herself as the demure little wife of the great artist Diego Rivera. He is the one who holds the palette and brushes in his hand. She holds on to her rebozo, a sign of her Tijuana identity, and to her husband, identifying as his wife. The next section, composing, relates to how Kahlo composed her look and how she composed her art. And we posit that the two are very closely connected. So in the drawing on the right, for example, Kahlo reflects on her own deliberate process of posing and composing herself and also composing or drawing a self-portrait with multiple arms, like a Hindu deity, she adjusts the angle of her head, she fixes her hair, and she wants to create a self-image or perform a self-image uh, that she chooses to present to the viewer. Then we see that she puts pencil to paper and sketches her drawing. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because while in New York for her show at this gallery, Kahlo had a brief affair with Julian Levy. So he took a series of intimate topless photograph of her arranging her hair that we see here on the, on the left. And he recalled, and I quote, it was a fantastic liturgy. She used to do her hair with things in it. When she unbraided it, she'd put these things in a certain order on her dressing table and then braided them back in. Yeah, so these two, uh, uh, the drawing and the photograph are shown side by side uh, in the show. And Cersei, can you tell, talk about these, this group? Yeah, sure. So we decided to group together several photographs by Carlos close friend, um, the photographer Lola Alvarez Bravo. And, um, and mirrors played a key role in the life and art of, of Kahlo. And they may be found in every single corner of La Casa Azul, upon the dresser, set within the wardrobe, embedded in the patio walls, and even inside the canopy of, of the artist's uh, four poster bed. Posing, self fashioning, and painting in front of a looking glass were frequent everyday activities. Yeah. So Frida Kahlo pose deliberately focuses on Kahlo's identity as a painter, which, you know, during her lifetime, she was overshadowed. Um, and we exhibit photographs that document her in the process of creating art. During her lifetime, Frida Kahlo was mainly known as Diego Rivera's third wife and also as a colorful personality with a unique sense of style. But her identity as a serious painter and the deep significance of her sartorial choices were rarely acknowledged. So Frida Kahlo began to paint after her 1925 accident forced her to drop out of high school and abandon her plans to study medicine. During her convalescence, the bedridden teenager started to paint using a folding wooden easel and a mirror set inside the canopy of her four-poster four bed, uh, which we saw in the previous uh, slide. The photographs in this section um, highlight Kahlo's art making practice where she's dressed in full Tijuana regalia 
and composes her paintings uh, very deliberately with a lot of intent. Uh, the images document her artistic journey from 1932, which you see on the left, until the end of her life, when she insisted on painting, even when hospitalized and confined to her bed. So here we see Carlo dressed in an iconic Tewana costume. Carlo paints the now lost wounded table. This is her largest painting, and it presents the 33-year-old artist in a stage-like setting that references the seated Christ at the Last Supper. She is flanked by Mexican artifacts, a Judas figure. Then we see a skeleton, her pet form named Granizo, her niece Isolda and her nephew Antonio. And we place a photograph by Guillermo Calo of Calo's niece and nephew showing Isolda wearing the resplandor headdress. And this photo is in dialogue with Silverstein's photograph of Calo painting herself with the resplandor. And note Rivera observing her in the act of painting and the wounded table in the background. On the same occasion, Silverstein photographed Carlo wearing this outfit in La Casa Azul here, as we see on the right. Carlo painted herself doubled or split in two throughout her life. Um, in this rare color photograph by Nicholas Marai, Carlo paints the two Fridas, Las Dos Fridas from 1939, one of her most important works. She paints one Frida as a European bride and the other as a Tijuana mother holding an egg-shaped portrait or photograph of Rivera as a baby. So this is a photograph within a painting and she holds it near her loins. Uh, as if he is her baby. This was painted at the same at the time of her divorce from Rivera and following several abortions and, mis, and a miscarriage. So Kahlo visualizes her inability or lack of desire to perform the normative social roles of wife and mother expected from women in Mexican society. Kahlo bleed, Kahlo's bleeding heart suggests that being a husbandless wife and a childless mother are wounding experiences. Or another possible meaning is that the pain is caused by the very attempt to conform to traditional gender roles. Thank you, Ghani. That was a very nice explanation. Here we see um, Kahlo sits in her wheelchair with Dr. Farrell standing at her side. Nearby the painting, self-portrait with Dr. Farrell, which is displayed upon an easel. We see a painting within a photograph. The work presents Kahlo in a wheelchair in front of a large portrait of Dr. Farrell. The artist's palette morphs into a human heart and the brushes are dipped in blood. Carlo documented the circumstances surrounding the composition in her diary. And I quote, I've been sick for a year now. Seven operations on my spinal column. Dr. Faril saved me. He brought me back the joy of life. I am still in a wheelchair and I don't know if I'll be able to walk again soon. I have a plaster course corset. Even though it is frightful nuisance, it helps my spine. I've started to paint again. A little picture to give Dr. Faril on which I am working with all my love. So we see Kahlo even in a wheelchair, even when she's barely out of the hospital, insisting on painting and being creative. 
which is one of yeah. the things that Circe and I highlight in this show. Um, here we also have on display her work table and a photograph of her in front of a sketch of the love embrace. During her lifetime, Kahlo had only two solo exhibitions, both in galleries and both for just weeks. Uh, the first was on November, uh, the first two weeks of November in 1938 at the Julian Levy Gallery in New York City. The second show, organized by Lola Alvarez Bravo in a gallery in Mexico City, was in April of 1953, just one year before Kahlo's death. Frida Kahlo Pose uh, includes a reconstruction of the uh, 1938 Milestone exhibition. And we did it with uh, in this way where we show uh, not just the information, but we present the catalog, which was actually a yellow fold out sheet with the 25 paintings listed on it. On the back, uh, Breton, Andre Breton wrote uh, an essay in French. Uh, we have the press release and all the uh, not so many reviews uh, that uh, were more gossipy than uh, art reviews. And then the 25 works that are were on, show, on view, including some of the sources for the, um, for the paintings. Uh, the black and white ones are uh, paintings that have been destroyed. So we only have them from photographs. And uh, we're very, very fortunate that this painting we actually have in the show. Um, so please come, come see the show. And it has been extended until January uh, 2nd. So come see it. So now we move on to the Blue House. So Frida Kahlo's life began and ended in the same place, La Casa Azul, today Frida Kahlo Museum. Her parents built the family home three years before her birth and decorated it in, in a European style, which was popular at the time. It was Kahlo and Rivera who renovated the house in the 1930s when they returned back to Mexico following a three year stay in the United States. They painted the gray walls in this vibrant blue that we see in this beautiful photograph, rejecting European colonialism and filled their home with objects reflecting their devotion to Mexicanidad or Mexicanes, including folk art, pre-Hispanic sculptures, local crafts and an amazing collection of around 400 votive paintings. Kenny. Since Kahlo was often housebound due to her medical condition, she transformed her home into a microcosm of Mexico. The archeological statues decorated uh, the lush garden and are also inside. Airless, it's squintly dogs, parrots, ducks, monkeys, and the pet fawn all uh, roamed uh, in the place. And here are some in installation shots. This is, uh, these are the photographs of uh, the pet fawn, her spider monkey feeding her ducks and this amazing painting. So um, here we see uh, Carlo sitting bolt upright on a straw chair. Um, and this pose may be a result of her wearing a medical corset under her repeal. Her Mexican identity is expressed through her Tijuana outfit, her gold torsales, which are these uh, golden necklaces we see here, and braided hairdo. And Carlos connecting eyebrows, pronounced mustache, and and her gaze present a radical non-conforming persona. Look how she's smoking um, cannabis 
aided by a delicate cigarette holder attached to her finger. And then we also see a tiny strange looking Mexican hairless dog standing nearby, but we see him alienated from Kahlo somehow. And both appear to be alone in an ambiguous and empty space that is neither indoors uh, nor outdoors. Um, and Kahlo's pets became her surrogate family. So in her paintings, they often attain symbolic significance or function as alter egos. Yeah. Well, we have to move to the next, the next section of the show, which is titled Exposing. Kahlo underwent dozens of medical procedures and surgeries in an attempt to alleviate the acute problems that plagued her right leg, spinal column, and reproductive organs. At times, she need, needed to wear plastic corsets or corsets made of other materials. We have leather corsets, metal corsets, and all these medical apparatuses, but she then decorated them and transformed them into works of art. Conversely, she used her paintings and drawings to examine her experiences of illness, disability, loneliness, and pain, but also resilience. So Kahlo, in fact, constructed a visual vocabulary with which he expressed physical and emotional suffering while also consistently articulating her own resilience and capacity to create meaning, joy, beauty, and art. Yeah, and, um, and we think that really Kahlo was a pioneer in fashioning the disabled body. Since early childhood, she developed a profound understanding of the self-empowering role that clothes and accessories could play in identity formation. And, um, so Kahlo maintained control of her image in life, in photograph, and in art, as we see in this exhibition. Highlighting, highlighting and hiding, concealing and revealing both her disabilities and her exceptional abilities. So the life uh, and work of Frida Kahlo express a potent rejection of ableist discourse and the constructive affirmation of herself as an alternatively abled being. Kahlo um, decorated and adorned her plaster corsets and integrated them into her wardrobe as if she had explicitly chosen to wear them. She used a mirror to paint the surface working from her hospital bed, for example. And in this photograph, Kahlo intentionally leaves her with heel to explore her, expose her corset as a second skin and as a work of art. And in this photograph, we see how she's taking control of her image with deliberate agency. Uh, she decides whether to hide or expose aspect of herself, performing identities through fashion, photography, painting and politics. Yeah, and uh, one of the curatorial ethics that Circe and I always think about uh, very intentionally is that we only show what Kahlo herself chose to show us. Uh, we don't pry in any way. Um, so uh, the last um, idea of politics, we see the hammer and sickle here. She's exposing her corset, but also through the drawings of her corset, she exposes her uh, political uh, beliefs and the, uh, her preoccupation with elements that relate to reproduction uh, related to the hammer and sickle. Uh, we show photographs that attest to Kahlo's very strong political convictions. Uh, on the left, an anti-fascist protest in 1936. You see her here, uh, still youthful. 
And on the right, this really, really important photograph um, is the last one in which Kahlo was seen alive. It's from July 2nd, 1954, 11 days before her death. Against the advice of her doctors, she left the hospital to join a protest against the CIA involvement in ousting Guatemalan President Jacobo Albins. And uh, as, as we said, this is her very, very last uh, appearance and uh, showing how strong she, she was. Yeah, now we move on to, to this beautiful lithograph, which is the only lithograph she did, no, Ganin? Yes. In May 1932, after spending time in San Francisco, New York, Rivera and Calo moved to Detroit, where he was commissioned to paint a major cycle of murals at the Detroit Institute of Art. Kahlo found out that she was pregnant and immediately tried to abort the fetus. The attempted abortion had failed, but on July 4th, 1932, Kahlo suffered a traumatic miscarriage and nearly bled to death. She began to paint in the hospital, and this was a moment of artistic transformation that, as we always say, uh, Ganit, that created the radical taboo breaking artists we know today. So could you explain us this beautiful photograph, Yanid? Sure. A so, sorry. A lithograph, lithograph. So um, five weeks after her miscarriage, uh, Kahlo went with her friend uh, um, to a shop and it was her first try to make, to compose a lithograph. And we're so lucky to have one of the rare copies in our show. So it's based on anatomical drawings and botanical illustrations, specifically from Aztec codices. Uh, she visualizes here a kind of personal tale, but within a cosmic setting. She divides herself and the composition into two. Um, these are two distinct part. One traces the loss of her unborn child, you know, showing the attempted abortion, showing the miscarriage. But the other uh, side shows nature's fecundity uh, with a lot of really interesting kind of parallels between the uh, fetus and the, um, the plants. But what we find most um, important is that she grows a third arm and in it she holds the palette. Um, this is really interesting because it's the very same palette that a year earlier, just a year earlier, Diego held, Diego Rivera held in his hand. So she is the one, here is the uh, comparison. At this moment, she becomes uh, the painter um, we, we know uh, as very, very subversive, very radical. Uh, and, you know, to the best of our knowledge, no one else ever before had tried to give uh, visual artistic form to a miscarriage, to these inner experiences. Thank you, Ganit. That was really, really amazing. Okay, so now we move on to this photograph um, we call on her wheelchair. So even as her health declined, um, as you can see, Carlo continued to dress up and construct her Tewana look. So in the photograph on the left, we see her in a wheelchair twice, once in front of the mural, in a second time painted within it. The photo on the right captures Kahlo after her right leg was amputated. She told her friends that she did not want to go on living without her leg. Yeah, and you see that we have quite a few photographs by Lola Alvarez Bravo. She was a really close friend of Kahlo's and 
So she, she really knew her and the photographs are kind of a collaboration between the two of them in, in showing and in presenting, portraying Kahlo uh, throughout her life in different forms. After Kahlo's death in 1954, two self-portraits remained in her studio as uh, this photograph by an anonymous photographer reveals. Both paintings, this finished one here uh, of herself in a sunflower and this unfinished one of her with Diego on her breast and Maria on her mind um, are in the exhibition. And although there's a sadness there, they also attest to Kahlo's resilience, her willpower, her creative drive, even as her physical and mental condition deteriorated, deteriorated, Kahlo exposed her pain, her despair, her sense of unraveling. In a diary entry, she wrote, I am the disintegration, but she did not merely endure suffering. She transcended it by persistently creating art and presenting herself even in these kind of loosely painted uh, works that she literally did on her deathbed. Even here, she presents herself as a Tijuana and she did so until the very end. Um, so the last of portraits expose Kahlo's deteriorated uh, state, uh, but also as a painter that she can't paint in the meticulous and controlled way that she did earlier, yet she continued to paint. And uh, this is uh, a photograph again by Lola Alvarez Bravo of Kahlo on her deathbed and still in full uh, regalia. Um, so the fourth section is titled Queering. Well, Carlos said about herself, I have broken many social norms, and she definitely did. Looking back at the images she left behind, her queer identity becomes apparent and much more evident. So for example, in this painting entitled Two Nudes in a Forest, it presents an Eden-like setting. Yet instead of Adam and Eve, two naked women are there, one light skin, the other dark skin, and they engage in a tender embrace. In Carlos revised Garden of Eden, women are not defined by their subordinate relationships with men. Moreover, Biracial love exists harmoniously, perhaps alluding to the artist's own mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. And um, although she was devoted to her marriage to Rivera, Kahlo pursued numerous loving, intimate, and sexual relationships with both men and women throughout her life. In keeping with ideas she conveyed to her friend Olga Campos, in a 1950 interview, and I quote, she told uh, Campos, in sex, everything that gives pleasure is good and everything that hurts is bad. I have never held back from sexual activities only because of sickness, end of quote. Um, this photograph, so this is the earliest work uh, that she did. It's a print of two women also with a kind of uh, erotic suggest suggestiveness. And the photograph that you see is by André Breton, and it shows Carlo with Jacqueline Lambab, Breton's wife, with whom Carlo had an intimate and beautiful love story. Yeah, so here um, we see this, this, this beautiful Nicolas Murray double portrait and um, Kalu said and I quote her I have the mustache and in general the face of the opposite sex end of quote and although best known for her elaborate self-representations of 
I mean, as an iconic Tijuana woman, Kahlo also constructed and performed alternative versions of herself. In photograph of her, this by Nicolas Murray, in paintings and in her diary. So she focused on her clothing, her styling and accessories to fashion diverse, complex and at times contradictory gender identities. Often she mixed masculine and feminine elements and, and performing a, a gender fluid identity. Yeah. yeah, and what, what we find extraordinary is that this began very, very early on. For example, in conventional family photographs taken by Guillermo Calo in 1926 at the Blue House, 19-year-old uh, Frida Kahlo flaunts an unconventional male persona by donning a man's three-piece suit and tie. Uh, in other vintage photographs, she sports a boy's cap. Um, so in numerous self-portraits, the artist boldly paints her dark facial hair, accentuating her mustache and bushy eyebrows, deliberately calling attention to what she considered her masculine or androgynous features at a time when such displays were, were really very bold and daring and uh, subversive. Yeah, absolutely. And in, to, in today's terminology, I mean, this is, we're talking 1926. So um, in today's, you know, as I was saying, terminology, we would say that color rejected cisgender binary categories and embrace definitely gender fluidity. Um, but of course, the language available to, to her regarding gender and sexuality were vastly different from what is available today. But as we always say, Ganit, all these materials and these photographs uh, show how ahead of her time she was, no? Yes, she was ahead of her time. She was a pioneer. And she was very, very courageous uh, to carve her own path and to kind of examine her identity and perform it. Uh, in mm -hmm. so many creative ways. So uh, Frida Kahlo Pose at the Rose Art Museum presents contemporary photographs from the museum's uh, stellar permanent collection that are in dialogue with Kahlo's queer self-representations. So works with, uh, that relate to gender ambiguity by photographers such as Patti Smith, Ajamun and Golden and others um, actually prove the point that you just made, uh, uh, Circe, that Frida Kahlo was ahead of her time, that she speaks to uh, contemporary artists, and that her legacies really continue uh, in today's art. So the final section of the exhibition is titled Self-Fashioning. And it embraces many of Kahlo's most iconic uh, photographs. Um, yeah. So, so here, um, the exhibition includes uh, Nicolas Murray's uh, portraits of Kahlo, in which she carefully posed and composed herself as uh, the mesmerizing Tewana woman. And. Um, here we see, look at this amazing photograph and her unique sense of style in, in, in Murai's innovative technique of photographing in color created these iconic and unforgettable images. And this photograph gave us a lot of information about the color of her clothes, the way she would style her, her herself, the, her favorite colors, um, yeah, her preferred earrings because we could, we, this uh, color print could reveal all this information to, to us. And, uh, and really bold and uncompromising, Frida Kahlo's all-encompassing artistic vision permeated every aspect of her life. Employing a rich panoply of creative gestures, she constructed, expressed, and reconfigured her multifaceted identities shaped by race, ethnicity, gender, politics, disability, beauty, and love as 
we have seen across this beautiful presentation. Gani. Well, as color posed for photographs, composed drawings and paintings, stylized her look, crafted her home, garden, and milieu. She engaged in brilliant and distinct modes of self-fashioning and world-making. And today, 67 years after the artist's untimely death, her path-breaking poetics of identity inspire artists, musicians, students, people with disabilities, people of color, members of the LGBTQ plus communities, and ever, ever expanding audiences. Yeah, I mean, following Carlos' example, many feel empowered to narrate their own lives and all experiences without fear. Thank you. Thank you.